Thanks. Uh, great to see you, Marty. Yeah. I appreciate you taking the time tonight. Everybody, I'm Chris Vicaro. I'm the uh, the least important of the conversation, but the most grateful for the fact that we get to talk to Marty, who his reputation precedes him and all of us in journalism at, of course, the Washington Post and the Boston Globe and the Miami Herald and the Times in LA and New York. Just so many so many great stories and experiences that Marty's lived and guided newsrooms through. So we're, we're grateful to talk about investigative journalism with him tonight, specifically uh, misinformation and the new age and, you know, how newsrooms and reporters and their tactics are, you know, really um, on the, on the front lines every day, you know, with, with the audience, with the stories, with the subjects. Um, and the person who you heard briefly when we just started, that was Adam Sennett, president of SPJ New England, who organized this, who's sponsoring this. He does a ton of great work for SPJ. This wouldn't be possible without his organization and just reaching out to Marty. So thanks to Adam and SPJ New England and thanks for everybody he's on tonight. And um, yeah, so so Marty, it's just, it's, it's just an amazing time in journalism, which I feel like people could have said for any time in journalism because the power of the press and what the reporters and editors have been doing for all these decades. But right now, today, you know, investigative, is marred sometimes by misinformation, by social media, by so many voices. And, you know, during the later part of your career, did you see that as a different time in journalism where reporters were battling a, a lot more or has there always been misinformation? Have you always guided reporters with your same tenets of how to deal with that misinformation? And, you know, how do you see it now versus where it's headed? Well, look, there's always been misinformation and there's always been efforts at disinformation, but we, in the previous times we didn't have the internet. Uh, so, I mean, keep in mind that the internet didn't really become, come under common usage until uh, the mid, sort of the mid 2000s, really, with the, um, with the spread of uh, high speed broadband internet connections. I mean, and you didn't have social media. Uh, you didn't have social media. You didn't, Facebook wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't founded really until the mid 2000s. Uh, same with, uh, you know, Google wasn't really the default search engine until then. You didn't have Twitter. You didn't have all of these factors that you have today. Uh, so even though there was misinformation and disinformation in the past, uh, it couldn't spread as far and as fast as it does today. So clearly it has much more of an impact today. And uh, various parties have learned how to manipulate those, um, those social networks uh, in order to um, uh, basically to exploit those social networks for their own uh, personal, commercial, or political ends. Now, investigative journalism, uh, there's there's so much good investigative going on. Uh, graduate schools, journalism schools are are building, you know, the, the ideas of journalism from an investigative perspective in their curriculum. Um, there's investment and resources towards investigative, especially in some of the larger media organizations. Do you see that some of the investigative stories that are out there losing their luster because of misinformation and because of social media and all this multi-platform rhetoric or or is investigative as powerful as it's ever been because of all the platforms that people can consume it on? Well, I think it continues to main, maintain its power. I think it's important to, by the way, to remember that uh, there was a period of time where a lot of media organizations were disinvesting in investigative journalism. Uh, they were concerned, particularly with the onset of the internet era, that it wasn't, it took an enormous amount of time, that it, it took an enormous amount of expense, uh, that it didn't generate the kind of traffic that you could see from things that were more uh, social or clickable or however viral. Um, and so a lot of news organizations at the time uh, were starting to disinvest. But I think that uh, people came to the realization that um, the public actually wants us to perform that kind of work. Um, and we could see, for example, when I was at the Boston Globe, that one of the primary reasons people subscribed to the Boston Globe was because of the spotlight team. Uh, we can see today that one of the primary reasons that people buy subscriptions is because of the investigative work uh, that news organizations are doing. It differentiates us from, uh, from everybody else out there. Uh, as to its impact, I mean, I still think that it has, it can, ha it does have and can have tremendous, tremendous impact. Um, and, uh, but there are determined efforts to try to, uh, to blunt that impact uh, with, uh, with social media, with um, uh, various misinformation and disinformation efforts. Uh, and the people who do that and the, in the interests that do that um, uh, you know, they know how to exploit those media. 
Um, and they find a ready market with people who are like thinking uh, and who have a very low opinion of the press, which is uh, sadly a substantial portion of the population. And, um, and they can try to discredit, uh, discredit the work. So the burden falls on uh, mainstream news organizations to uh, present their work in a way that is more persuasive, more convincing, that contains much more documentary uh, evidence of the stories that they're of uh, the sort of the thrust of their investigation. And uh, that's a challenge uh, for everybody, but it's something that I think that we all need to work on. I think of, you know, that investigative stories these days need to be presented to the public in the way that a, a lawyer would present a case to a jury. Uh, you need to lay out the evidence. They need to be able to see the evidence. You need to be able to put it in front of them. So, uh, news organizations need to take advantage of all the tools that are available to them today. So if there's a video that's documentary evidence, then show that video in context. Uh, if, there's a, if there are affidavits uh, that are supportive of what you're writing about, deliver the entire affidavit, An annotate it, show people where you're pointing to, uh, put it in context in the story. Um, you name it, all of those kinds of all of those kinds of things. So whether it's original documents or annotations, animations, uh, um, you know, video, uh, photo evidence, all of that, I think is incredibly important. Some of the kind of work that is being done by uh, the Times and the Post and other news organizations, sort of what's come to be called sort of forensic uh, forensic video investigations. Uh, I think is very powerful, what showing what happened on January 6th with the videos, uh, with the recordings, uh, with, the, te with the, um, um, the cases that have brought, been brought against individuals, all of that, and putting it all together in a seamless whole uh, is very powerful work. Will it persuade everybody? It's not going to persuade everybody. You're never going to persuade everybody. Will it, will it be persuasive to, um, uh, to more people than if you don't? Include it, I think it will be. Uh, you know, basically, the the layering of the content, the quality of the content, and all this extra media that you can put in there, either complementary or embeddable, it makes it interactive. So you're talking to the experience now of the investigative reporting on top of the actual storytelling. And are there pieces of your consumption habits as a fan of media, as someone so tied to it for all these years that you're gravitating towards? Are there certain teams, reporters, outlets, aside from the ones that, of course, you ran, um, that you're looking at for, you know, the best investigative reporting today? You know, I mean, I, I guess my, like, there's only so much I can do uh, in the course of a day in terms of consumption. There's a lot out there that I would like to read and to consume that I don't, because I, there's just so much time. Otherwise, I would spend all day doing that. I know that I'm retired and all, but I still don't have unlimited time uh, to do that. So, um, you know, I tend to look at the Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, uh, the Atlantic, uh, New Yorker, uh, you know, ProPublica will have its investigations, look at that. And then there will be, episodically, there will be other outfits that have a work that I want to take a look at. Uh, but I tend to look at the, I tend to look at the main, the main ones. Uh, in terms of misinformation and, you know, doing the news gathering during the reporting process, there's so much information out there. There's so many, um, you know, social threads and channels and deep holes, if, you, if so to speak. There's a lot of journalism students on this chat tonight, too, who are just figuring out how to gather news and how to trust sources and build sources. Any, any thoughts on, you know, the, the basic principles of trusting online sources, how to vet them, things that you've you've guided younger reporters on when they have something that seems interesting, but it may not be the most perfect source until you vet it. And, you know, some, some of that is basic journalism 101, but some of that in a digital world gets a little complicated. Well, it's hard to talk about in the abstract. I think we, you have to talk about the specific things. I mean, obviously, uh, you can't just use anything that you stumble across online because you, you need to know what is the source of that information? What is it? Uh, what, who, who is that organization? Is that organization an advocacy organization or is that organization truly independent? 
Um, is it, um, what is the research, is the research really well, um, well founded? I mean, what is, is an, if there's an assertion made here, is that assertion, what is that assertion based on? Uh, where is the raw data? Is the raw data being interpreted correctly? Uh, I think anything that you come across, you need to check against other sources of information as well, uh, and not just rely on one, on one source. And so, um, uh, you know, I'm going to call that reporting. I mean, that's basically what it is. It's reporting. And that means you, uh, you do more work, you check with more people, you, uh, uh, you weigh this against what, what's coming from another source and then, and try to make a, you know, determination. You go to, you go to authority, to, to sources of information that are considered to be, have traditionally considered to be authoritative, um, and reliable and, um, and, um, and don't necessarily just go do some source of information that reaffirms what you might think the answer is, uh, but go to ones that, that actually have, have been a reliable source of information. And I wanna make sure people uh, put questions in the chat that I can make sure Marty's able to read and I'll moderate and you know, relay that stuff. So if you have questions, please start putting them in the chat and we'll get to those. But um, in the meantime, um, from a professional development perspective for reporters, you know, there's, there's a lot of tools out there to weed through, again, the, the term misinformation um, or faulty images or data tables that are, you know, populated with the wrong data. There's a lot of ways to catch that. And some of that is on the data science perspective, but some of that is just regular, you know, knowing tools today. In your time in, in news leadership and management, did you stress the professional development of the reporting and editing staff to know about those tools to not just have a news sense in your gut, but to have the technology to help vet those types of situations? Well, we always tried to provide people the kind of training that they, they needed. Uh, so if there were seminars uh, that they needed to go to, if there were programs that they could participate in, uh, we always tried to, we tried to support those things. Uh, we also tried to point out, certainly with, for example, the uh, people who were involved in uh, computer assisted journalism who were um, assembling huge masses of data. Uh, I think everybody understood that you don't just collect the data and go with that. You have to actually go report that data out uh, because there's a high, a high risk that that data will misstate what is going on, um, that there are anomalies in the data, uh, that there are quirks in the data, uh, that there may have been a flaw in the entry of the data. Um, and so you have to go to experts in the field and say, okay, here's what we're seeing. Uh, what do you make of that? Uh, is this, are we interpreting this correctly? Um, and, and then do reporting on like, who are the human beings behind that data and see if that's, uh, see if that's supported. So just collecting data is just not enough. Uh, you have to, um, you actually have to talk to human beings. How about from a from a local journalism perspective? I work in in local media from television perspective. Um, you know, there, there's always only so many resources that you can devote towards investigative, uh, but it's an important part of newsrooms. And you've obviously worked in the biggest and with, with some of the most resources, uh, and then you can dedicate that on specific stories for very long periods of time, and hopefully with really good outcomes from storytelling. What about from the you know the local newsrooms that only have a few reporters or limited resources? In your eyes, how do you how do you make sure you still do investigative to serve that community, but not spread yourself too thin or you know sort of go above and beyond without you know killing yourself? Uh, again, it's hard to answer in the abstract. I mean, everybody has to know their own news organization and what are the other demands that are being made on you. Um, but I mean, you, if you look at just the Pulitzers, and it's not the only standard to look at, but if you look at the Pulitzers, you'll see that there's been a lot of great investigative work by smaller news organizations. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, whether it's a newspaper in the Virgin Islands or whether it's the, uh, you know, there's been great investigative work in Puerto Rico by a nonprofit center for investigative reporting. Uh, there are, um, you know, um, in Willamette, Oregon, you know, there was great investigative reporting that led to a Pulitzer also. Um, so, um, uh, you know, they figured out, okay, what are our priorities? Um, it does this story show promise? Uh, is it worth an investment of time? Are there people that we can collaborate with that would help uh, amplify our, um, our capacity? Uh, um, you know, that sort of thing. So, I mean, I think that uh, that's for, 
in a way that's for managers to decide, not for reporters to decide, is for the managers to decide, you know, how can we make this happen if it appears to be important enough, if it appears that there that the investigative um, that investigative pursuit is promising. And um, you know, that's really it's a matter of how to manage the resources on the staff. And none of it is easy. Uh, there's no easy answer. I could give you a glib answer, uh, but um, uh, somebody has to say we're going to give up something else in order to do this work. And so when you're in a smaller news organization, there are going to be many things you're going to say it's just not worth it. But at other times when you see that it is worth it, then you really have to figure out how to make it happen. All right. And we got a bunch of questions coming in, so I'll start to relay some of them. Again, got Marty Barron here, uh, thanks to SPJ New England. So appreciate everyone tuning in. Um, so this question is, from Mr. Seifert, uh, one of the uses of misinformation now, now that hurts journalism is simply flooding readers with extraneous stories and information in an attempt to drown out real journalism. Is there a way to counter such tactics? I'm not sure what you, what do you mean by extraneous, uh, sort of extraneous journalism? I don't quite know. I don't think we can unmute him. Uh, if you can type in the chat, is that Dan Seifert? Let's see if we can clarify quickly. Simply flooding readers with extraneous stories and information in an attempt to drown out real journalism. Hmm. Well, if if you could clarify, uh, we can come back to that. Yeah, if we'll I come back to that. So, what what do you mean by that? I don't. Oh, he just says not important stories. So it's just you know fluff. Uh. You know, I don't know. I mean, look, I mean, if there's an important investigative piece, uh, if it's powerful, it's going to stand out from everything else. Uh, there's just no doubt about it. Uh, it's, um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff on the web um, and there are a lot of stories. Uh, but if you do a powerful investigative piece, uh, people are going to notice. Uh, it's going to have, it's going to have impact. And um, it's pretty hard to drown that out if you have the goods. Uh, and then there's a question from Bob Lipa down from Long Island. Uh, what do you foresee for the future of print journalism? Can print and digital continue to work hand in hand? Well, they can continue to work hand in hand as long as print continues to exist. Uh, uh, I think it will um, it'll exist. It'll continue to exist. It's exist. It's continued to exist longer than people expected. The death of print journalism has been forecast for at least a <laughs> couple of decades now. Uh, but the reality is that it's declining and uh, declining at a rapid pace and um, it'll reach a point where it's no longer sustainable. Uh, I don't know when that's going to be. I doubt it's in the next five years, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's in the next 10 years. Uh, it's just not the way that people live their lives. Uh, people are getting their information off of digital devices, um, particularly mobile devices. And, um, and uh, you know, people may, be, may feel an attachment to print, uh, they may romanticize it, um, uh, and that's all good and well, but the reality is that that's just not the future. And this says, not necessarily a question, but regarding seeking sources and looking for information, a key question I like to ask myself whenever I do the necessary research for my stories is, who paid for this website, news outlet, the salary of the person providing the information? The answer to that often tells me a lot, uh, you know, is, can you comment on that from a journalistic perspective? This is from one of the students at Hofstra University. I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, who's funding it uh, is really important. Uh, I think that's true, particularly these days where you have a number of sites uh, that are so-called research sites that are being funded by people on the far right. Uh, but you also have uh, similar activities on the far, on the left. Um, and these are people with an agenda um, and and I don't think that you can just rely on that information without doing additional research. It doesn't mean that everything that's published is wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, but it means you damn well better check it out. Um, and because people, the reason those the reason those sites are being funded is because they have an agenda that an ideological agenda that they're trying to advance. Good, good uh, statement there, Dahlia, and good thoughts, Marty. Of course, uh, another one. It, it's similar to Bob's, but so I'll advance the question, Mikey, is uh, not is print journalism a sustainable career path? Is journalism a, a sustainable career path? And obviously we wouldn't be on this call if it wasn't, but the future of journalism from for this perspective of students here, yes or no, sustainable career path? Well, I say yes. I mean, um, 
you know, I, uh, I went into journalism in 1976 when I got out of college. Uh, we were coming out of a recession. It was a bad year for journalism then, and it's been a bad year, supposedly a bad year for journalism every year since, and I made an entire career out of it. So uh, uh, the reality is that journalism is just changing. Um, and I think just because there's been a decline in print, in print journalism doesn't mean that there's a decline in journalism writ large. Uh, the, real, the reality is that there are all sorts of new sites that are popping up. Journalism is, is kind of taking a different shape. There are many sites that are highly specialized. They may specialize in politics. They could specialize in music. They can specialize in sports, uh, all of that. I mean, um, you know, um, and there are real opportunities there for people or science or medicine or whatever it might be. And there are a bunch of those sites out there um, that are, that are uh, very different from what we experienced in journalism previously. Uh, what you had in the past were very large mass media sites that were large mainstream news organizations, geographically based, um, and uh, whether they were TV stations or uh, 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 newspapers, uh, a, hand, a few networks way in the, in the past before a bunch of new networks came into existence. And so, um, uh, but that's all changed. And so, you know, you have the, had the emergence of outfits like uh, uh, STAT in Boston, which focuses on uh, science and medicine. You have the emergence, you had the emergence of The Athletic, most recently acquired by The New York Times uh, a company. Uh, you have, um, uh, you know, you had BuzzFeed, you have Politico, you have Axios, uh, you have uh, ones that are sort of newsletter oriented. Uh, you have all these new sites with all different kinds of opportunities. And um, I don't think that that suggests that journalism is dying as a profession. What it suggests is that journalism is changing as a profession. And, um, and so, and particularly for younger people who are getting into the field, you really have the opportunity to advance your careers at a pretty rapid clip because uh, there are still people in journalism who are neither willing nor able to do what's necessary in a digital environment. And if you are willing and able to do what's necessary in a digital environment and are good at it, uh, then your career should advance at a pretty good pace. Yeah, as I've told a lot of the people on this call, flexibility, agility, and learning multi-platform journalism and storytelling will essentially allow you to evolve with the industry. You know, I, I have a print journalism degree as well, yet, you know, I'm working for a broadcast news outlet. I didn't ever imagine I'd be in touching video or managing reporters and anchors with video, yet here we are because I've adapted with the industry and storytelling. Um, another question from Eric Munson. I saw the movie Spotlight. It was a great movie. Obviously, it's a, it's a drama, dramatization, but um, how long and difficult was the actual arduous investigative reporting process? And I'll advance that slightly. Um, anything changing in journalism or publishing today that would hinder that story even just a few years later, or would it have been done all the same way? Uh, it would be done. It would be done differently. I'm sure. Um, mm -hmm. I'll get to that. Uh, I mean, I I think uh, well, it really started. It started after I got to to the Globe. Uh, it was launched as the movie shows on the first day at the first meeting. Uh, I brought it up, and um, and then we embarked on it. And we enlisted the Spotlight team to to start looking at it, uh, and we also contacted our lawyer, uh, whom I didn't know, uh, but I talked to on my first day there. Um, uh, about how we might go get the court documents uh, that were under court seal. So, um, uh, so there were parallel tracks. There was the reporting investigation, and then there was the, our effort to obtain the internal church documents uh, uh, from from the court, um, and um, and that lasted until we published on January. Uh, I should know the date by heart, but it's the <laughs> early January, early January of two thousand and two. So we just passed the 20 year anniversary of that. And um, uh, so that's how long it took. There was an interruption as reflected in the movie, accurately reflected in the movie, which was the interruption was called 9-11. Um, and so the reporters who were working on that investigation had to be pulled off to help uh, with our 9-11 coverage, as you may uh, remember. Um, uh, some of you may be too young to remember, uh, which is kind of, uh, dismaying to me, but um, that, um, um, you know, two planes out of Boston uh, crashed into the World Trade Center. So, 
Um, uh, it's a huge story, obviously, biggest attack on the United States since Pearl Harbor. And um, everybody needed to be deployed on that. Uh, but after after four weeks or so, we let them go back to their uh, regular assi their assignment of investigating um, the church. So uh, as to whether the story would be done differently, I think it would be very hard to sit on what we had. Um, uh, I'm glad we were able to sit on what we had because we could tell the much bigger story. And we also didn't have to tip off our competitors to what we were uh, working on. Uh, and so, um, but I don't know that we would be able to do that today. It's just too competitive an environment. The other thing that I think was helpful to us, uh, to be honest, is that we, uh, while the internet was hugely helpful to us because it really was as, um, um, has been described, has been described uh, by an NYU professor, uh, sort of the first big internet investigation, sort of an investigation that played out on the internet. Uh, so um, you had people all over the world who were able to see our stories, uh, people all over the country, people in dioceses all over the place. In the, past, in the in previous era, the church had always been able to say that these were isolated insta instances. But with the internet, now people were able to compare notes. They were able to organize themselves, uh, mobilize on the internet in a way they couldn't before, uh, and able to put pressure. And the Vatican was seeing these stories. So... Um, um, so it, it's, it's, its impact was highly amplified by the fact that there was an internet um, and that people were using the internet in a way that they had not previously. Um, so uh, it also, uh, but I'm very glad that while there was an internet, there was no social media, uh, frankly, uh, because um, there's a very good chance that somebody on the, we took great care with those stories as reflected in the movie. I did take out just about every adjective I could find uh, because I did not want any inflammatory language uh, to appear in the stories. I didn't want the, to give the church ammunition with which it could attack our journalism and raise questions about our credibility. Uh, but in the era of social media, it seems almost inevitable that somebody on staff would go on to Twitter or wherever and say something impulsively with language that we would not have used in the we would not have used in the in the globe, um, you know we took great care with the headline with the we wrote the lead that was written the photos that we used, and even then you know we would make a mistake here and there because um, that's that happens um, a photo too big for what it was really worth that that sort of thing, uh, but we took great care with that and we institutionally decided what's the appropriate way to cover this so that we. Uh, so it has the impact that we want it to have, and it has the credibility that we want it to have. And there was no possibility that any one individual on the staff could go off on his or her own and say something that would become a representation of the of the globe, but is not something that we that we approved of in the first place. Uh, so somebody you know could have been talking about you know uh, priests and marriage or. Uh, some other issue, uh, ancillary issue, and um, or say it in a way that we would not have we would not have wanted, and thankfully we didn't have we didn't have to deal with that at the time. I'm very glad. Obviously, you know that that story speaks for itself because of the amount of work and because of the movie and because of the outcome. Other other investigations that you worked on in your decades of journalism that you know maybe early in your career that don't get the the limelight that they would today because they, they were so long ago, you know, what, what really stands out from an investigative perspective for you and your, in your time? Uh, well, I think what stands out is something that came later and that was obviously the Snowden leaks out of the national security agency. When I got to the Washington post, that was the first big story I dealt with there. Yeah. Those were the most highly classified documents in the U S government. Um, and uh, we had an individual who, had by then left the country and was providing us in an encrypted form um, uh, the most sensitive documents, national security documents that anyone could ever imagine. Um, and we had to decide whether to publish or not to publish, and we decided to publish. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's interesting that in today, I mean, it was huge at the time that we did it, uh, but somehow it's been forgotten. Uh, <laughs> I'm kind of amazed. I'm hardly ever asked about it anymore. But at the time, you know, it dominated the discussion. And um, uh, all of the national security agencies were incredibly pissed off at us. Uh, there were people in government who suggested we should have been prosecuted. We and the people at The Guardian who also were recipients of these documents should have been prosecuted. Um, 
uh, under the Espionage Act of 1917. And, um, and so, um, you know, um, it was just huge and, um, and a very difficult, diff incredibly difficult story, highly technical in many ways, um, very competitive, uh, but also, you know, you were, we were working on sensitive national security documents at a time that wasn't that far off from 9-11. Uh, where people were still very worried about uh, terrorist acts and the possibility that these documents might um, make it easier uh, for terrorists to do um, to do their work as they envision their work. Is there no there's no movie about that? <laughs> I'm going to bring that back into the line. Mean, there's a documentary about that that's yeah. it's focused on it's, it's focused on Glenn Greenwald at the Guardian, uh, and it's, it's called Snowden. And I think there's a separate. Um, dramatization as well, if I'm not mistaken, of Snowden. So um, so there, are, there is a movie on it. It doesn't focus on the post. Yeah, and so not necessarily misinformation, but so much information and credibility and the sourcing and that you talked about like even the digitization, the encryption. I mean, it's a whole other level of gathering info and deciphering it. And the legal, a lot of, especially students, younger folks, they may not understand the legal implications of working with a legal team while the investigation is going on and making sure everything is proper. Meanwhile, you have the Espionage Act right there in your faces. Do you get nervous? Where, where, does, the, where does the gut and the instincts come in versus legal advice? And you know, walk us through that process You've, from when you first hear about this to executing and publishing. It's not easy by any means. Right, well, there are... Um... You know, you always want to work with your lawyers on these things, so particularly on anything that might uh, defame someone or call into question their uh, their reputation, uh, their professional reputation or personal reputation. Um, you really have to talk to lawyers to lawyers about that. Um, but at some point, it becomes not a legal question; it becomes an editorial decision, uh, a judgment, your judgment as to whether you should go with the story or not. And it comes down to a question of, in many instances, to a question of, is it fair or is it not fair? Uh, do we have, do we feel we have the real, the, the goods here or don't we? Um, is this a story that deserves to, really deserves to be told? And should it be told exactly this way? Uh, you know, that's where you get into a lot of internal debates within newsrooms about those sorts of things. And those can be quite, uh, quite tense, quite difficult. Um, and so, um, and those are those are judgment calls. Um, you know, when it comes to, for example, the NSA stuff with the Snowden documents. You know, there's something where the inst we it was not just. Um, um, I mean, there's well, you could put the inst the entire institution at risk. Uh, there was, and, I mean, journalists have not been prosecuted on the Espionage Act of 1917 in a very long time, uh, but it's not inconceivable that they they would be someday. Um, and, uh, and it's not just the journalists, it's the institution could be fined, uh, could be subject to crippling fines. Um, and so um, you have to think through whether you're, you know, are you putting the institution at risk? And that's a decision that has to be made collectively. It's something that certainly in that instance, I spoke to our publisher about it. Uh, I had approval to go ahead. Uh, but I, I would never have surprised a publisher with that kind of a story that could put the entire institution at risk. Um, and, uh, and thankfully, you know, the publisher trusted me um, and, uh, and things worked out fine. Uh, but um, a lot of these are judgment calls. And, and I think in this instance, you have to say, well, is this a story that's really in the public interest? Um, we determined that it was a story in the public interest, that there had been a um, massive surveillance of uh, a level of intrusiveness on the part of the government into people's uh, personal communications um, that um, had occurred, that had been come about without any public debate about this uh, level of uh, intrusion on, on individual privacy. Uh, it was done with the idea of uh, um, national security, um, but you need to weigh national security against individual privacy. And, um, and there'd been no debate. And the question was, well, if we don't write anything, then the national security agencies will just continue to encroach even further on people's individual privacy without the American public ever being aware of this uh, and never approving, certainly never approving it. So, um, 
uh, we decided that it was a subject of enormous uh, public interest and that we needed to publish. Um, and, um, and so that's why, that's why we went ahead. Um, so, but those are, those, all of those are very difficult decisions. I mean, not all of those, all of the decisions are quite as grand as that one. Um, a lot of them come down to, I mean, I think we have to recognize that when we write stories, we have a tremendous, we can have a tremendous impact on individuals. Um, and you need to think through, are we being fair? Are we not being fair? And, um, and, uh, and I think that's really important to do. Um, and I think, you know, anybody who has been the subject of coverage thinks so too. Uh, I've been the subject of coverage and I, I think it's really important to think about is, uh, uh, are we being thorough? Are we being fair? Are we being open-minded? Have we given the person the opportunity to say what they have to say? Uh, are we actually listening to what they have to say? Are we interested in what they have to say? Um, uh, are we just are we just going through a pro forma exercise of getting somebody's comment? What I what I like to call checkbox journalism, uh, and that we've checked, we got their comment, but we didn't really care. We don't really care what that person has to say. We've already decided what the story is going to say. So um, I think all of those are really difficult. And I think we all have the responsibility for thinking those things through uh, in a fairly deliberative way. And, um, and so those are the kinds of issues that you have to deal with. Another question here, uh, have you been following the journalism out of Ukraine? How do you think they're covering this crisis? Has anything struck you about the media coverage and the, the bravery of journalists on the ground? I think people are doing a great job. Uh, I think, you know, the journalists who are there are very courageous. The place is being bombarded. It's probably going to get worse. Uh, people are in, they're about, I believe there are about a thousand journalists in Ukraine right now. Um, I think the, the coverage is quite compelling, both from all different kinds of outlets, you know, um, and uh, I'm just totally admiring of the work that's being done. And, um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not so admiring of some of the commentary that people do sitting in a studio, uh, you know, at some of the, you know, sort of pronouncing on, you know, who's responsible for this or what could have been done to prevent it or that sort of thing. I think that most of that is pretty ignorant um, um, and is just done for, to, to, um, uh, uh, to try to appeal to their audience. And, um, and, and I, I find that pretty, um, uh, dispiriting. Um, and, um, but in terms of the actual reporting on the ground, uh, and the reporting out of, out of Washington and out of the, out of Europe, um, I think it's been really, it's been really impressive. Another question, uh, from the group from Monique, subscription-based models are what more newsrooms are depending on to stay afloat. Page views aren't the main driver anymore. With that said, more newsrooms, specifically iTeams, are encouraged to publish their investigations in pieces on a rolling basis to maximize readership and engagement. What are your thoughts about this approach? Does this negatively affect or positively boost a project's impact? I don't believe that uh, investigations should be published on a rolling basis solely for the purpose of engagement and traffic. I think they should be published on a rolling basis if it makes sense journalistically to do so. I don't, I think that, you know, in the past, um, you know, we would, uh, investigative teams would work for, I don't know, months, six months, a year, whatever, and they would deliver this gigantic project, you know, 10 part, 10 part uh, series, uh, each one would be, you know, uh, 9,000 words or whatever. Um, it's just more than any, any human being could possibly read. Uh, and maybe that made it look really good for prize purposes, but it wasn't really conducive to actually being read uh, by the public. And so I don't think that's always necessary. And I think it's often better that you publish uh, what you have and then move on to the next story uh, as part of that investigation. If you have something to break, then break it. Um, and, uh, uh, but to do, and to me, the argument is to do it for journalistic purposes, not to do it because we need some traffic or we need some, you know, we need engagement. Um, I think that's the wrong, that's the wrong motive. And, and, and if you, if, if you start with that as the rationale for doing it, um, 
it's not going to lead to it's sort of backwards it's not going to lead to good journalism it's going to lead to publishing things that aren't necessarily ready to be published some other questions here um about social media and big tech having a place uh in the digital world affecting you know the visibility of media content you know uh, can you talk about the role of you know, the facebook's twitter instagrams of the world and how they gate content, how they may allow people to see certain things, how they may take a stance politically against some uh, public officials, then just their place now in society in relation to media and the content that surfaces on their platforms. Well, they're enormously powerful, obviously. I mean, there are only a few of them and uh, and they have a tremendous impact on the traffic that is is directed to uh, our media sites. Uh, so obviously if you're on page three of a Google search, you're not gonna get any traffic. Uh, it's just as simple as that. Uh, you have to be in the first couple uh, or first three uh, citations really on Google. Um, and so uh, that's an enormous amount of power on the part of Google. Uh, Facebook, same thing, although it's become, Facebook's has become less important as they de-emphasize the newsfeed and they, it looks like they're gonna do even probably do even less. Um, so, um, um, you know, for historically those, um, those outfits have been able to collect all the revenue and not assumed any responsibility. I don't think that's sustainable. I think they have to take responsibility for what appears on their sites, at least to some degree. And so um, uh, I think they've begun to see that. I think they have begun to do that. Uh, I think they've, the Google of today is not the Google of the past. Uh, the Facebook of today is not the Facebook of the past, and the Twitter of today is not the Twitter of the past. Um, so I think they they do bear responsibility. It's hugely difficult for them, by the way, uh, because uh, you know they have billions of billions of users uh, who are posting instantaneously in every language in the world uh, at all hours of the day uh, and every minute and every second. Um, so that's really difficult for YouTube or Twitter or you know. Uh, Google or any of these out Facebook or any of these outfits to monitor that they can I mean they do have tens of thousands of people who are doing that and then they have to make judgment calls uh, with limited information uh, so um, uh, but I do think that they have to exercise more responsibility uh, I mean I'm not I'm not inclined to sort of get into <laughs> section 230 of the communications DTC act but um, it's so complicated but um, I think if they want the protections of that, then they have to demonstrate that they have a system, at least at least a system in place for that's effective, uh, generally effective for dealing with misinformation and disinformation. From Adam Sennett from The Globe and SPJ New England, a great question. Do you miss going into the newsroom every day and working on investigative projects or just being in the, you know, the hustle and bustle of news? Uh, you know, um, I did it for 20 years, uh, as well, 45 years overall as in my career. And I was the head of a news organization, three different news organizations for 20 years. Each one I went into coming from the outside, although at the Miami Herald, I had worked there as a reporter, but I came back in 20 years later, uh, the Boston globe. I didn't really, I didn't know anybody at the globe and I didn't hardly knew anybody in Boston. So, um, and then when I went into Washington, I came in as an outsider. I had not worked in Washington uh, for any, I mean, more than like a few days working on a story or something like that. So, um, uh, and they were all eventful periods. Those, all of those were eventful periods. There were huge stories in each place in Miami. Uh, we had initially the Elian Gonzalez case, if you remember that. A few, we had the um, uh, 2000 presidential election, uh, uh, you know, the previously contested presidential election. Uh, we, um, when I got to Boston, we had 9-11, we had the Catholic Church, uh, we had all sorts of other things. Um, and, uh, and then in Washington uh, was the NSA, and then along comes Donald Trump. So uh, we had, it's been an incredibly um, busy time. So, you know, when I, um, I mean, I was um, 66, and I uh, and I was, I've been at it. And in the current environment, you have to be at it 24 hours a day, every minute, instantaneous, seven days a week, uh, all the time. Um, and 
that's exhausting. And so I was tired. I was ready to do something else and to uh, live a bit more normal life. And uh, so I don't regret uh, choosing to live a bit more normal life. Um, and, you know, I felt like I did what I wanted to accomplish, what I wanted to accomplish, and I feel good about it. And, um, and so, um, and I feel like it's time, you look, I mean, when you're 66, I mean, it's about, my view is that it's about time for somebody else to take over somebody who's of a younger generation. And, um, and that it's pointless for me to stick around forever. And, and so I, and I was ready to do it. And so I thought a lot about it and the timing seemed right. Um, and so I miss being around a lot of, you know, the people I was around. Uh, it's nice to be, it was, you know, great to be part of the big stories, but I feel like it was the right time for me. So I, I don't, I don't have a regret. So for the younger people in the next generation, the people who have taken over and the people who will take over in 20, 30, 40 years from now, what's the, what's the thing they should think about? What's the thing that should be at the foreground of their reporting, their editing, their management? You know, how, how would you school the, the, the people doing it now and the people that are on this call who are hoping to do it in the future? What should they focus on? And if there's any last minute questions that you want to put in the chat, do it now. But otherwise, we'll wrap up on that, you know, for, uh, that note of uh, wisdom from Marty. Well, I don't know if it's wisdom. You haven't even heard it yet. Uh, but <laughs> um, so, you know, look, there's a huge debate about the direction journalism should be going. Uh, there's a huge debate about so-called objectivity in journalism and all of that. My view of that is that um, uh, it's really important for us as journalists to put a value on genuine reporting. Uh, that when we go into stories that we don't know exactly, we may have a hypothesis about what the story is, but that we need to do thorough, comprehensive, um, diligent, rigorous reporting. Uh, and that means uh, looking at every document you can find, look at all the evidence you can get a hold of, talking to all the right people, actually listening to those people, hearing what it is they have to say, um, uh, being open-minded uh, uh, to, um, um, regardless of what your own personal opinions happen to be as you embark on a story. And, um, and so, and to me, that's the most honest, honorable way to approach journalism. And, uh, and that is in fact, in my view, the meaning of reporting, because if we already know what the story is gonna say before we've done any, any, we've spoken to anybody, then I'm not sure what we mean by reporting. Uh, so, so that's, that's what I value. I mean, I always say, um, you know, people ask me, what do I look, what did I look for when in the people that I hired? I said, I look for people who are more impressed with what they don't know than with what they think they do know or what they think they know. Um, and uh, because a lot of what we, we think we know uh, we don't really know that well. Um, we come in with a lot of assumptions. We come in with a lot of uh, preconceptions. And, uh, and it's important that we get beyond those preconceptions and go out and report um, and, uh, and see, what, see what the evidence shows. And, um, and that's, you know, that's what I would like to see from journalism. And there's one other question. We'll end on Bob Lipa's question. Over the course of your career, have you noticed a change in the way reporters write stories? And I guess from, from a technical perspective, but also from a literature, you know, and, and uh, grammatical and flow perspective, or has it been the same? A story is a story for the last, you know, 30, 40 years. I think there are a lot of, uh, I think there are a lot of new formats for stories today uh, that didn't exist before, obviously because of the internet. So, um, I think that you find um, uh, in many, so it grows out of sort of the old blog, blog culture. And, and that is that these stories are written much more informally uh, as if you were speaking to a friend or a family member rather than writing a very, in a very structured uh, uh, newspaper style. Um, and, you know, there were always literary stories. I mean, even when I was working at the Miami Herald as a reporter, uh, the Miami Herald had stories that were incredibly literary in style, great narratives, things like that. Uh, but now you see stories that are, look, I just saw something online about the, you know, a videographer at the Washington Post was in the hotel room before she and a colleague went out to the, went out on the streets to report. And there was this young boy 
uh, playing on the piano in the hotel, uh, playing a Philip Glass, uh, one of the Philip Glass piano pieces. And it was just a remarkable moment because um, it's very emotional uh, to see that, this boy having the composure to sit there at the piano in the lobby of the hotel playing this piece while um, uh, the city's likely to be bombarded. So uh, that's a story. <laughs> and it went out and it, they put it on Instagram and a million people have, have I think, is it a million or nine million? I don't know what it was. It was a huge number uh, who have now viewed that. And that's a different kind of story. And there's nothing to say that's an inferior story. It's actually in many ways a superior story. And, and so there are many different formats that people use now. And we talked about some of this at the beginning where you integrate um, all the tools that we have in one seamless story uh, where uh, if you're talking about a document that immediately you can click there and see the original document and see what the passage that you're referring to or if you're referring to uh, something that occurred that happens to be on video, uh, that you can see the video just it, like in, embedded uh, and all of that. And so those formats didn't exist in the past. And I think that we're what we're seeing is a lot of experimentation, a, a, a good experimentation with story formats, which is becoming, and my, my hypothesis is that journalism is becoming more visual uh, because society is becoming more visual. And so, um, and because on the internet, we have the capacity to be more visual, uh, we should take advantage of that. Um, and uh, it's more, it can be more powerful. And so those are stories of a sort that we never envisioned doing in the past. Uh, we didn't have the capacity to do them. Uh, we didn't have the tools to do them. Uh, I mean, I remember when I was at the Boston Globe begging for video cameras, you know, for money to buy video cameras. We didn't. We didn't have any money to buy video cameras. So um, uh, we didn't have any videographers. <laughs> we barely had a social media team. Uh, so, um, um, so yeah, also the formats have changed tremendously and there will be ones that I haven't even, I haven't even thought of. This is awesome. We appreciate your wisdom, your guidance, everything you've done for journalism and uh, Appreciate you taking the time tonight. So stay safe, stay healthy, and Great. my best to you. Thanks. Thanks very much for your interest. I appreciate it. Take care. Take care, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks to SPJ New England and Adam Sennett for making it happen.